We do have a word coming from Romans, the 12th chapter. Some of you will be surprised because it's only going to take two verses. I know you all didn't think I could preach two verses, <laughs> but I can. Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. This morning when I shared this word with the earlier crowd, I, I told them then that I was feeling a certain type of way about the message we have. And I believe that the Lord allowed during the course of sharing with them that I feel a lot better in sharing this word right now. I feel a little loose. I feel like I might have a little dance. My Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2, reading from the New International Version. It, says like th it reads like this. Therefore, <clears throat> I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The second verse, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I'm going to ask that you pray with me as we spend the next few moments speaking from a title, Living with a Sense of Urgency. Living with a Sense of Urgency. Our Father and our God, it's again that we come before you, Lord, and we're here at this moment, Lord, to hear a word from on high. Search our hearts, O oh Lord. Give us a clean heart, a right spirit, to hear your word, to receive your word, and to make the decision, Lord, to act upon your word, to be transformed by your word where transformation is necessary. So then, Lord, we ask that you would let the words of our hearts and our minds be pleasing in your sight, Lord. Everything that we think, everything that we do, Lord, will be pleasing in your sight because of our transformation that we have allowed to come into our lives. Father, I ask that you would touch your servant right now. Take me out of self. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Let the words let the voice, let the image represents nothing more than the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. And may we be transformed because of that presence. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Living with a sense of urgency. Last week, in celebration of Pentecost Sunday, we shared with you from a title, Going Public. We shared where the Lord poured out his spirit among those who were assembled, those who were looking to receive something special from the Lord, the work of the Holy Spirit. We mentioned on last week that in order for the church to survive, we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. And among some of the points that we lifted up, we made the point that the Holy Spirit was given to the church to give her the power and the influence to live as Jesus 
would have us to live. We mentioned that from the pouring out of the Spirit, the lives of the believer, the church, were empowered by the influence of the Spirit. And, and under that influence, we said that the Holy Spirit, we mentioned that one of the Spirit's function is his control over the believer's life. I, I wonder whether or not we, we understand and we can receive that, that the, one of the, the main purposes of, of the Holy Spirit is that we allow the Holy Spirit to control our life, to take charge of our life. We, we mentioned that our thoughts, our walk, and our behavior, our attitudes are changed because of the work of the Holy Spirit. We also mentioned that without the influence of the Holy Spirit, the church cannot survive, and we as individuals cannot survive. Knowing that we have the power is one thing, but how are we to activate and use that power is something else. N knowing that I have the power doesn't mean anything unless I know how to release that power. Knowing that I have the power means nothing if I do not allow that power to work with inside of me. Knowing that I have worked out every day at the gym and built up my fine muscular body means absolutely nothing if I can't pick up this drink. Or that I can't, help, help me, Lord, help Mrs. Wilson. I, don't know how, oh Lord. I, I think I hear her saying amen. My, my point is that doing all of these things and allowing and understanding the spirit is within us, it means nothing if we don't let it work within us. We, we also mentioned that without the influence of the Holy Spirit, that the, the church cannot survive, as we mentioned. But now we have to ask the question, how does that power play, the power of the Holy Spirit, play in our daily lives? Well, what, what does it look like in, in everyday reality? Because we have the power, Paul conveys that we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifice to God. We're, we're not to live as the world, in other words. How easy or, or difficult is that? Uh, one thing for sure, whatever it takes to live as the Lord wants us can never be done from the power, apart from the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit allowing it to enable us. You, do, you can't go through this world and say, I'm going to be a Christian and never call on the power of the Holy Spirit. To. You can't go through this world and say that I'm going to live for Jesus and, and not have the Holy Spirit. You better bridle my tongue right now, Holy Spirit. You, you, can't, you, you can't say that, that, that I'm yours, Lord, everything that I have and everything that I am, Lord, and not call on the Holy Spirit to keep you from boy if you say that one more it's nothing but the Holy Spirit that can keep you calm and keep you focused oh I think some of y'all know what I'm talking about Paul pens this letter to the church at Rome, which is designed to be heard by all the believers and new converts. It, it, it was at first a pastor teaching his young congregation how to live as Christ. So there, there were some, some theological misunderstandings that, that seemed to have crept in and developed, and they were contradicting their prior religious training and their, and their, their culture. And Paul had to kind of settle this a little bit. The, these new converts were caught between two different worlds, a, a Greek world, and they were trying to coexist with a Jewish world. And now a new belief system, this Christianity, has been added to the mix. How do we cope with all of that? 
to the questions or the problem that Paul addresses is really no different than what we face when we have decided to surrender to Christ. I, I wonder if anyone in here can, can, can relate to the fact that when you, when you decided to be a, a part of Christ, when I've decided to give my, my, my life and my heart to Christ, that I was at times conflicted. That there were, there were times when I had to make a decision that knowing what was right and knowing what God required, but also knew what the culture wanted me and expected of me. I, I knew what kind of habit I had. You, you, well, you can't, have, you can't have a party unless you, unless you, uh, I don't need to say it. I think y'all get it. For Paul, it was important for, for his young church to seek and to embrace their responsibilities to Christ with a sincere sense of urgency. Hey, he starts out, he says, I urge you. Hey, he's letting them know that this is important. I think that when we go through our life, we have to go through our life with a sense of urgency. Time is winding up, you know. So he says, I want you, I want you to have this sense of urgency as you work out your soul salvation, if you will. Wow. Living with a sense of urgency. Well, 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 Paul starts out this part of the text. He says, therefore... I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Therefore, if you were reading this text, I would hope that that therefore will 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 uh, uh, stimulate your 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 appetite or your desire. Therefore, what? <laughs> what do you mean, therefore? Somebody come up to you. My wife coming to me. Therefore, you better eat. Therefore, what? Does that mean you ain't going to cook no more? You're not going to fix my bowl? What do you mean, therefore? I need to know what's behind therefore. For Bob, he begins this part of the text with a conjunction, a, a transitional conjunction. He connects the reader to the previous section of this writing. I wonder whether or not, if we're reading this, that you're curious enough. I want to know, what, what, he, what was he talking about? What happened before this? I'm not going to go through it. I'll just summarize it or paraphrase. In the previous section, Paul, Paul discusses God's, God's promises and faithfulness towards his people, the ones who have embraced Christ as Lord and Savior. He wants to remind them. He, previously, God had promised to protect Israel. God is faithful in seeing them through, through, through no effort of their own. He just decided to do that. Therefore, Paul states his conclusion after this, in view of God's mercy, I urge you, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, based upon God's mercies, there's something that we need to do. In the Greek translation of this word mercy, the actual word is plural. It actually, the actual meaning is mercies. In the preceding chapter, Paul deals in great depth with the mercies of God. As I read that and I reviewed the, the previous part of this particular book, Paul reminds us that Christ died for us by the mercy of God, not because of anything that we've done, not because of any goodness out of our heart. God called all of us here. I, I thank God Amen. the day that he said, Fred, I need you in my kingdom. Fred, I, 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 I got a job for you. I need you to surrender your life. Right. By the mercy of God, he chose me. Uh, it reminds me of Jeremiah. He says, I, I knew you. I, I formed you before. You even was thought about by your mama and your daddy. Can you think about that for a moment? That God has something for each and every one of us in here, and he did it before the beginning of time. Can you imagine that? He knew my name. Before the beginning of time, by the mercies of God. He, he, uh, Jesus justifies us by faith, he reminds them in the previous part. By the mercy of God. 
our sins are forgiven. Not because we tried to do good, but only by the mercy of God. I wonder if any one of us in here have more than one mercy of God. Uh, by the mercies of God, I am standing here before you today. By the mercies of God, he, he protected my life. By the mercies of God, I, I did not get involved in something that would, well, that would haunt me for the rest of my life. By the mercies of God, he protected me that I didn't hang out with the wrong crowd. I, I hung out in the beginning, but by the mercies of God, he touched my mind in such a way, gave me courage in such a way that I told my friends, no, I ain't going. And they laughed at me and called me a punk. Yeah, I'm a punk. Yeah. But now, some of my friends who wasn't a punk is pushing up daisies in their grave by the mercies of God. When you think about it, Paul wants them to, to understand and he, he wants them to reflect. And that's what I, I'm sharing with you today. Reflect what God has brought you from. Reflect where you could have been. Reflect that somehow when you wasn't even thinking about God, he was thinking about you and you made a decision long before you gave your heart to Christ that allowed you to live free today. The Lord did not have to do what he did, but because of whose we are, we have this unmerited favor called mercy. So when Paul says, in view of God's mercy, in spite of considering the fact all that God has done for you, in view of God's mercy, he's making an ethical or a moral obligatory appeal to believers as if we owe God our obedience uh, or that we are indebted to God in some way. Not indebted that we think we can pay God back but indebted in such a way that out of gratitude, by the mercies of God, Lord, what can I do for you? What is it that you would have me to do? I, 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 as an older daddy now, I think Mrs. Wilson and I did pretty well in raising and providing for our children. Well, I don't say it to them to their face but perhaps I might be saying it with the little sad look on my face. Perhaps, daughters, out of gratitude, you might want to buy your daddy a, this for Father's Day. <laughs> Maybe that fan that's to go out on his deck. So I got one of my daughters here, you know what I mean? <laughs> but out of gratitude, we, we, out of gratitude, God is saying, I've done something for you. I saved you, you know. I didn't let you go down that rugged road. I didn't let you see your end that you were going to. I, I gave you a detour, you know. So out of gratitude, will you do something for me? In view of all that God has done out of his mercy toward us, why can't we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? A body that is holy, a body that is pleasing to God. Paul says that this is really your true and proper worship. How then do we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice? Well, we, before we can, we can really begin, we, we have to look at how Paul phrases this text. Anyone reading this letter during the first century understood that, the only, that only the priest could offer any living thing to God as a sacrifice. Yeah. Only the priest. So Paul, in essence, is conveying the idea that as believers, as one who has surrendered their life to Christ, as one who wants to be a part of Christ's family, 
that God sees each and every one of us in a priestly relationship. One who is authorized to offer themselves as a living sacrifice. You can't offer me up. I can't offer you up. I can only offer myself up, but I can only offer myself based upon my relationship with Christ. We can only offer ourselves as living sacrifice only because God sees us as unblemished and worthy for sacrifice. He died on the cross, you know. He took our sins. That makes us unblemished. It doesn't mean that we are perfect, but he has justified us in such a way that we can offer ourselves. But now, because we know that we can offer ourselves, I wonder if we're willing, willing to offer ourselves. Well. What comes with that, saints, is a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of behavior. There are some behaviors that many of us don't want to give up. As I, as, I, as I read this text, you know, even though it's, it's a simple form, but I think y'all might get the message, I, I look and say, is he telling me to give up oatmeal raisin cookies? <laughs> as simple as that sounds, it represents a bigger picture. My family knows, don't you bring no oatmeal raisin cookies around me. Don't leave them unattended. But you want to know something, saints? A lot of us have oatmeal raisi raising cookies in our lives. There's some things about our lives that if it goes unattended, we'll mess ourselves up. I'll eat up the whole package and think nothing of it. Some of us will do some things and think nothing of it. But here, he's dedicated himself. He wants us to dedicate ourselves. When we fall off our bodies as a living sacrifice, our tongue no longer speak lies or spread gossip. It becomes an instrument to speak truth and power into someone's life. See, that's when we're transformed. I, I, wonder, I wonder whether or not because we are transformed people, because I'm trying to do it God's way that I want to speak power into your life. I, I want to speak God into your life. I want to speak positive into your life. Uh, or oh, 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 we just, child, I'm going to tell you right now, that was me. I'd have cut him loose. I'd have done this or I'd done that. What is it that we're speaking? You see, when, 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 we, when, we, are having, when we have a transformed life, our tongue looks for the opportunity to spread the gospel. Come on, man. I, I, I wonder. You ain't, you ain't got to raise your hand. You, you ain't really got to tell me. But I wonder when was the last time we, we shared the gospel to a non-believer. Oh, it's easy to share the gospel with a believer. We ain't doing nothing but swapping stories in. But sharing it with a non-believer. When, when when, when, when our hands will no longer look for a fight and, and work to produce evil. Our hands will lift up those who have fallen and bring healing to those who are hurting. Can you see the urgency of that this present day? I, I wonder how many of us know people who are hurting right now. P -p people who need someone to pick them up. Not chastise them. You should have been a better steward of your money. Not chastise them that I told you you shouldn't have gone that direction. You just never listened to me. They don't need to hear that now. They need someone to pick them up. They need someone to brush them off. They need someone to encourage them to say, yes, you made a wrong turn. Yes, you've made a bad decision, but that's not the end of the road. Check your GPS. 
I believe that the Lord will turn it around for you. I believe the Lord will get you back on track. I wonder whether or not uh, if we have a transformed body and a transformed mind, can the Lord use us in that way? I have to ask myself that question many a time. When, 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 when you give your body as a living sacrifice, you can truly feel no ways tired. <laughs> Helping the homeless find shelter. No ways tired feeding the hungry. No ways tired sharing the, the good news of the gospel. No ways tired visiting the sick. No, no ways tired teaching a young single parent how to exercise patience and how to raise his or her child and not criticize him. No ways tired volunteering and doing something in the church. When we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, our arms will embrace the lonely. Our ears will listen to the cries of the desperate and those who are broken in spirit. Well, when we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, our voices will not be silenced, our strength will not waver, and our resolve will not fade. When we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, our faith will sustain us. When we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, I wonder whose life can you impact? Whose life can you, you see, when we offer ourselves as living sacrifice, many times and often we, we do it at the expense of feeling good, feeling comfortable ourselves. I wonder if God can use us that way, that this is not the way I would normally do it every day. I know I need to go and visit so-and-so in the hospital, but I... I got to get my sleep in less, at least until 10 o'clock. And uh, when I get up, maybe if I feel okay, I might go. I wonder if God can take us out of our comfort zone and have us to do things for others. I, I wonder, I, I, I share this with you only because it's a, I feel it's a testimony. I don't share it in the sense that, 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 that we're any better than anyone else, but but years ago, my wife and I opened up our home in New York. And uh, I was driving one day, and I saw a young man I knew from childhood. But I hadn't seen him in, at least by that time, 25, 30 years. And I said, I know you. I, even, I forgot his name. And I called him over, and he was homeless. And my wife and I brought him into our home. He was an alcoholic. We worked, straightened him up. By the time he left our home, he left our home to get married. Some period of time later, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe the man who, 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 who was working as a train engineer, subway engineer in New York, and he drove the subway, and and uh, he was divorced from his wife, and and his wife taunted him every payday. He had a young child, and she, he would, she would come and meet him at, at the job, and she said, "You make it, I take it." She didn't spend any money on that child, so he had to give money to her and then had to turn around and give money to his child and on a personal basis. And she taunted him. She would come to his job to collect the check that they had already cut for her with her boyfriend. You make it, I take it. And then one day, if anybody familiar with New York City subway on 14th Street, that's that big interchange where all the subways change. And here was a man driving the train. He stopped at 14th Street at lunchtime. He said it one time too many. He got off that train and they left it. And somehow we crossed paths and we brought him into our home. And we worked with him, built him up. And by the time we left New York, he was rehabilitated. And we got a letter from the city after he had been out of the city some 15 years wanting us to give him a recommendation. And he got that job back. Amen. That's the Lord. I wonder, during that period of time, my wife and I went without. We were struggling financially. 
I shared it this morning. We lost our first house. Lost it to foreclosure. Tacked on the door. I went down to the, to the, uh, to the auction. Wanted to see who's going to take my house. Took my house. But you want to know something, saints? I never gave up on God. We never gave up on God. He had to take us through that to prepare us for the ministry that he had down the road. Down the road. Because we found ourselves in, such, in a situation where we were ministering to people who were losing their house, wanting to commit suicide. No, don't commit suicide. It's not the end of the road. God will bless you. And now today, it's not that we have a fabulous house, but we got a house that's almost twice as large as the other one. Ain't missed a mortgage payment in 15 years. God will bless you. But you want to know something, son? It takes a whole lot for the Lord to be able to do that and you not fall apart. When you dedicate your life, your soul to doing it God's way, even doing all of that what we was going through, the Lord said, reach out to that homeless person and bring him into your home. Reach out to that person who wanted to commit suicide, who left his job, couldn't take it anymore. Bring him into your home. I share that with you because someone might be going through something right now and think that you can't make it through. And Lord, I'm serving you. I'm trying to do the best I can. I'm reaching out, but it seems like every time I try to do what's right, the enemy has a way of pulling me back pulling me down. If you make up in your mind to be transformed, God's words say he will see us through. So here we have this. Just no wavering. No sitting on the fence. When you make up in your mind that I'm going to sacrifice my body, sacrifice my mind, that means, Lord, I am ready to change Wherever change needs to be made in my life, I am ready to do whatever it is that you would have me to do, Lord, no matter where it takes me, as long as I know that you're with me, Lord. Sometimes we have to go through the test of time, saints. There is a sense of urgency that God wants to get over to his people. There's a sense of urgency. There are people that I want to bring along your way. There are people, there are things that, that I need for you to do that until you've made up in your mind that I'm transformed by the word of God. You'll find out that we're doing nothing more than marking time. I want to move forward, Lord. So we're living in critical times, saints. There is a sense of urgency. Paul says that when you get it right, when you do everything holy unto God, this is your proper worship toward God. Well, when, we, when we present or sacrifice our bodies to God, we are presenting ourselves in a spiritual act of worship. Most of us get the inner act of worship, the prayer, uh, the praise, the meditation, the reflection, the running around, the hallelujah, the waving, hand, all of those. We get that. But the most challenging part of worship is dedicating or sacrificing this unblemished body to the Lord. That's the test. The test is, how, what is it that you want me to do, Lord? What is it that I need to stop doing, Lord? How do you want me to present myself to you for your glory, Lord? And we might satisfy ourselves because we wave our hands every now and then. Because we... <laughs> Nothing wrong with all of that. But that should be a reflection of what's going on on the inside. What's on the inside should be what's coming out on the outside. But God wants to make sure, can I change your mind? Can I change your way? Can I change you in such a way that you are going to please me and not yourself? Even if you must lose your home, 
even if you may lose your job and your career, can you please me? Can you be transformed in such a way that I can now use you the way I need to use you, that I can use your home the way I want to use your home, that I can use the husband and wife relationship the way I want to use husband and wife relationship. When we present or sacrifice our bodies, we are presenting ourselves in a spiritual act of worship. And we have to recognize that whatever we're doing for the Lord, it's a form of worship. If we are not careful, the world will have us diminishing God's standard while elevating the world's standard. Yeah. He'll have us diminishing God's standard and elevating the world's standard. The world will turn their head to everything and let you do anything but call on Jesus' name. That's the only thing that upsets the world, it seems like. We see this happening now. Marriage and family are in jeopardy. Who would have thought in 2016 we would be debating bathroom issues while people are starving, lost, and dying to a sinful life? And we ain't got nothing better to do than to decide, try to decide what bathroom you should be going in. <laughs> Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. When we are living and behaving uh, what our mouths have confessed, it is the ultimate expression of worship. And then Paul tells us just how we are able to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's easy, y'all. How do you do it? You're about to ask him. I know I can see it on your face. Well, Reverend, tell us. Tell us now. How do we do it? Well, look in the second verse. Just do not conform to the pattern of this world. That's a whole mouthful, Reverend. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. In other words, and to understand what, the, uh, what it is that we're not to conform to, we need to understand what it is that we need to conform to. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I wonder, can God change any of our minds? Uh, yes, Reverend, I know what's right, but this is what I want to do. Uh, yeah, I, I know that the Lord probably requires this, but this is what I want to do. I, when, when, this, when was the last time the Lord, sh the Lord now, I ain't asking when you changed your mind, but when was the last time the Lord changed you? You ever been in a situation where you felt the Lord led you, was leading you in a certain way? Well, the Lord has led me to do thus and this and this and that. And then after you get involved in it, whatever the case, now the Lord might want to take you somewhere else. Just because he, he showed you something back in the 1950s doesn't mean that it's applicable today. Can God change your mind about anything? Can he change your mind about a position that you are taking theologically? Can he change your mind about a position you've taken with your family? Can he change your mind about a position you've taken with your wife, your husband, or your children? Can God change your mind? Uh, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Lord, renew my mind in such a way that I will always be in your will. Do not be conformed to this world. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, he says, you will be able to test. Then you'll be able to approve what God's will is. I know what God's will is. Why? Because my mind has been renewed. The entire, th the entire theme of this Bible is to direct the reader and believer into the direction of holiness or Christ-likeness. Paul is telling his first century readers what we 21st century readers need to hear and obey right now. Do not conform to the prevailing culture if it does not conform to the will of God. Sounds much, e much, much easier than done. That bathroom bill, I think, is an example of that. I wonder if that is the weeds that's growing among the good seed. Read chapter uh, 13 of Matthew. You got weeds growing with wheat. And sometimes we want to pull up the weeds. You pull up the weeds, you'll pull up the wheat too. And it tells us 
The, the, the good master told the servant, he said, no, nah, let it stay there. Uh, uh, the, the, the harvester, he'll get it. No, don't worry about it. It's going to work out at the end. I guarantee you that. If we don't, for some things, we just have to just leave it to the Lord and let him work it out. I ain't going to trip out over that. I'm going to tell you that now. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we are able to be transformed, saints. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to be transformed. Many people try to do it on their own. How many of us, guilty, uh, guilty as charged, tried to do it on my own? And every time I did, I messed it up. <laughs> tried to make money on my own, I messed it up. <laughs> Trying to do things your way. Uh, let me just share this with you real quick. I, I, I don't know what y'all do in the, in the beauty salon, but us men, we go to the barber shop. And in the Bible shop, that's where you hear all the philosophies of life. Every, all the answers, all of the complexing questions are answered in the Bible shop on Saturdays or whatever day you go. So one day when I was in the Bible shop, someone asked a question and, and it, it created, almost created a riot. That, the question was very simple. If you came, I'm going to use myself as an example, you came to my house, just me and you there. You're in my house now, and you find five, you walk in, you find five dollars on the floor. Who does it belong to? Me, me in my house, right? Yeah. Okay. You'd be surprised how many people said, no, it's my money I found. The losers, keepers, finders, weepers, whatever that thing is. <laughs> A big argument. You talking about what? Your mind is so messed up that you can't think straight. Uh, sometimes, now as simple as, and as easy as that question that I've just posed to you was, we deal with it every day in our everyday life. God is up there saying, man, that's an easy question. There is nothing to think about. Just do it my way. I, I got one more. Well, just, just one. Y'all let me just tell this. One more story. One more. When I, when I, I used to sell insurance. Well, I, worked, I, I was in the insurance business for 17 years. Ten of those, seven of those years, I sold. I was a good salesman. And, uh, and I mean, I had a good closing ratio. And one day I was in the barber shop, and one of the brothers came in. Y'all know who he is. Had a pair of pants. <laughs> had tags still on them. I could look at them until they weren't his pants. <laughs> hey, brother, they were good pants. And I bought them for about $10, about $40, $50 pair of pants. Every time I wore those pants, I ain't never made a sale. But I didn't figure that out in the beginning. All I knew, something going on. I can't make a sale, and I'm a good salesman. And one day I was thinking about that. I was reflecting on my, on my life. And I sat there, and I crossed my legs. And when I crossed my legs, I saw my pants. That's it. I'm trying to sell insurance with hot pants. I had to get rid of my hot pants, y'all. And I'm telling you the truth. I got rid of my hot pants, and my closing ratio went back up. <laughs> Trying to do it my way, the Lord told, spoke to me then, and that's been about 35, 40 years ago. Don't you buy nothing hot. I don't care if it's a DVD, CD, or whatever. Don't you buy them old fake downloads or whatever y'all call that stuff. Do it right, and God will honor you. But many of us have gone through life doing it our way. And the Lord is saying, transform your mind. Transform your life. Transform your behavior. I'll take care of you. Just trust me. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're able to be transformed. Many people try to do it on their own and will always fall short. Being transformed is developing a new way of thinking. Being transformed and our thinking is not allowing the culture to squeeze you into a form of thinking that, that's inconsistent with God's word and God's will. In most instances, cultural thinking is more attractive than godly thinking. 
However, in all of godly thinking, it is more rewarding and successful than cultural or worldly thinking. By nature, we are all copycats. Ain't nothing original. We copy off each other. We copy off my, copy off my daddy, copy off my mama, my brother, my, everybody copy off everybody. Ain't nothing original. But the issue is that we must make sure that we are copying the right example. And we have to make sure that we're in position that we are, that we represent a right example. What I shared with you was when my wife and I have gone through, a hopefully the only purpose is to share with you, perhaps it's a right example for someone. Some things happen, you know, I, I share with that. I hope no one's judging me. Don't call me a, a poor steward. You don't know, Brother Calvin, my story. Now, I ain't sending him out. You all know that's what he said. You don't know our story. I, I can't share you the whole story. But there is a story, you know. But I share with you that part of the story that you know that it's because you were not walking with the Lord. Then you need to know that part of the story and come to grips with it. But you also need to know that part where you were walking with the Lord and that everything was going to be all right. You need to be able to share that story unashamedly. I stand here with my shoulders back, my, he my head held up high. The devil can't hold anything over me. Some people might say, well, uh, Reverend, why, why you share something like that? Because it's my testimony, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This book gives us a, a plethora of right example, examples. This book gives us what Paul refers to as good, pleasing, and perfect examples of what a transformed mind looks like, what it behaves like, what it talks like, what it thinks like, and what it acts like. When we have accepted, when we've accepted Christ as Savior, we should look to and expect a change to come over our lives. Being transformed, saints, means that our purpose, our meaning for life is transformed. While I'm pursuing a career, my reason for pursuit must have a Jesus standard. It must have a Jesus factor included in it. While I'm pursuing a husband or a wife, my pursuit must have a Jesus standard or a Jesus will. A Jesus factor must be included. While, 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 while I am looking for direction, for God to point me, I must have a Jesus model that I'm following. I must have a Jesus example that I'm pursuing. I must have a Jesus will that I'm desiring. Everything that I do should have Jesus as the focus, Jesus as the leader, Jesus as the light that I'm pursuing. We must have Jesus as a, a standard. He must be a part of our will. He must be our model. We're transformed now by thinking that we are a transformed individual. A transformed mind and a transformed will must always include God's will. My will and God's are naturally incompatible, naturally, until I make it my purpose and duty to renew my mind. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what, is God's, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul says that when we truly are linked or are in sync with the mind of Christ, then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is for our lives. Only a renewed mind is able to test able to discern, able to, able to approve and appreciate and obey what God's will is in our lives. It is when we are willing to obey, saints, willing to obey. Many people know what is right, but not many are willing to obey that which is right. A renewed mind will submit and obey. Paul's letter was simply to address the people of God who were saved by the mercies of God and willing to do the will of God. I wonder who here today is willing 
to present their bodies as a living, as a living sac sacrifice and allow the Lord to transform your thinking. And while he's transforming your thinking, he's also transforming your circumstances. It all works together, you know. But we have to make up in our minds. That's why I said earlier, I prefaced my, my sermon today by letting you know that this is not an easy thing to really embrace when you really, really, really are fighting against what you know God wants and what the culture will accept. Because a lot of what God wants, the culture frowns upon. But you have to make up in your mind, am I going to please the culture? Am I going to please God? Sometimes we got to bring it home. Am I going to please my husband or am I going to please God? My wife or God? My family, my career or God? My boyfriend, my girlfriend or God? My homies or God? My career, my job or God? Those are not always easy decisions until you've transformed your life and your mind then there's no contest let's pray our father and our God we come before you right now Lord maybe there's one here today Lord and they're wrestling right now they want to really step out in faith Lord 